God. You want to look at every word and every little detail in that scripture. This spring, my son, he's right, he was right over there. <laughs> he, uh, this past winter, he bought some attachments to go on the corn planter. And we have learned in the last three, four years, probably more detail about corn production than I'd learned in uh, 50 years prior to that. I've been farming this in my 56th crop. What you want to do, you want that corn planted so that it all comes up at the same time. Each kernel. Every word in that scripture, you want to stand out the same. God put those words in there for a reason. Amen. And I don't know how many thousand dollars he spent on that planter, but it was cheaper than buying a new one. And it still wouldn't do what that did because these two guys figured out what it was to produce that crop. You want those words or those kernels to come up at the same time to produce a plant that the sun shines on that the same all the way through so it'll produce a full-size ear. You want those words in that scripture to have the same light on every word so that you can see and understand the truth of that whole verse, not just part of it. So as we study the Word of God, remember that you want it to grow together, every word of it. And let it say to you what God intended for it to say. With that, let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you've done for us in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Without him, we would have no reason to be here today. And Lord, we pray that we might make this pass these passages as clear and plain as possible. And that each one of us can grow in the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of your word that we might be better ambassadors for you as we're still here on this earth for what time we have. For we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. My topic this morning is baptism. And as Brother Jordan said, if you want to start an argument, just mention baptism. Because, first of all, it's misunderstood. Nobody, most of the people don't know what baptism means. There's an argument as to who should be baptized. What kind, how should they be baptized? And as they talk about baptism, the misconception that every baptism had something to do with water. Should a child be baptized? Should it be sprinkled, splattered, dunked, half drowned or whatever? I've been all of them. Didn't do a thing for me other than two things that it does for most people. It gets them wet, that's the first thing, and it gives them a terrible sense of false security. They have the awfulest sense of false security. Oh, I got sprinkled, splattered, dunked, half drowned when I was a little kid or whatever. Didn't do a lick of good. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 3, and the one that we want to look at, how many baptisms are there? Well, some say there's 12 I say there's at least 12. And uh, the one that uh, is mo uh, most prevalent today is probably the most dangerous one. We'll get to it last. Turn to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And we just want to see the one. Most people, if you'd ask them about where did baptism begin, they'd say John the Baptist. Started way before him. If it started with John the Baptist, how come it doesn't say somewhere in there, what's this strange thing that John the Baptist is doing? What's, what in the world is he doing? It had been going on for years and years and years. They knew what it was for. Let's read those uh, in, in this verse here. It begin with Matthew 3, verses 1 through 6. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about him, 
and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, one of the first things I want to say is, what did John the Baptist look like? Some of them say he looked like a, a Harley rider that crawled out of a hole in the ground because of the way he was dressed. Have you ever seen camel's hair on a garment? It's real soft, and it's beautiful. He was a representative of God. And he had this big belt, this Harley Rider's belt around him. But what color was that camel's hair? Well, it's a tan or brown color. And what color would that belt be? It'd be a matching or a contrasting color, wouldn't it? What a thing wrong with what he looked like. Would you go out to some some thing that crawled out of the hole in the ground to be talked to, to be praised and so forth like he was? I wouldn't. Nobody else would either. But notice what that verse says. In verse 5, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Look at every word. Let each word come up and let that light hit it for what it's worth. And every word is what God wants us to know. So John the Baptist was a nice looking guy. And one of the things of a priest, John the Baptist was a priest. As a matter of fact, he was the last Levitical priest, true Levitical priest on the, in the scriptures. Did you ever know that? His mother and father, and it tells us that they were uh, in, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 5, that they were the tribe of Levi. Uh, of Levi. Wherever you read about the next priest, they were just chosen by, at uh, random by election, weren't they? Who was to be the real priest after John the Baptist? The priest of the tribe of the Lion of Judah, not Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek, and not after the order of Levi, wasn't he? So John was the last of the uh, true Israelite Levitical priests. Let's go to see, uh, see what it says in uh, verse 13. When the Lord comes to him, uh, I'm going to kind of get ahead of myself so you won't have to come back to this. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Have you ever heard the phrase, we need to be obedient and follow Christ in baptism. Show me the verse. Show me the verse. It's not there, is it? You can't find it. I mean, you look those scriptures over and you won't find it. It sounds good, doesn't it? And you know, there's, uh, man has a, has a way of coming up with words and comments and things like that that sounds good and it isn't any more true than uh, anything. It fits like socks on a rooster. I mean, it, it don't work more than nothing man the moon. Doesn't fit the scriptures at all. Pardon? <laughs> Turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now, we see that all Judea and all around about went to him to be baptized him. And the Lord said, suffer it to be so now. He fulfilled that law. What was the last thing the Lord said on the cross? It is finished. What was finished? The law and everything prophesied about him. He had done it all. Now we're ready for the new covenant. Okay, in Mark chapter 1 and the first four verses. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets. Now, this is not mystery because it's the beginning of the gospel of, the Son of, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, according to what was written in the prophets. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare thee the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What's the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins? 
What was it that Israel needed to repent of? We don't have time. I'm kind of watching this clock up here. But they were stiff-necked. Who was the last one to tell them that they were stiff-necked? Stephen in Acts chapter 7. What did they... And, and the evangelists and so forth, in, in years past, I've seen them come up there and they almost get down on the floor and beat on it with their hands and fists and, and say, we need to repent of our sins. That's a bunch of baloney. That's not what that verse is talking about. Because can you name every sin you've ever committed? Okay, we'd be here for a long time, wouldn't we? Why does it, what does they, what are they talking about? If Israel is stiff-necked, you know what that means? I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't care what you tell me. God was a God to the nation of Israel, but they wouldn't listen to him. How many times do you find an Israel was obedient to the word of God? How many times, how many times, uh, you're right. You None of you raised your hand or said anything. Because they never did. They were stiff-necked. So it said to repent and be baptized. Notice which comes first. The repentance always comes first. Why was they to repent? Well, for lack of time, I'm going to just tell you. They was to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What was one of the requirements for a priest to be? When, why did the Lord say, suffer it to be so now? Or why did it, was it suffered to be so now? Because he had to fulfill all righteousness. The righteousness of what? What was Christ? He was a prophet, a what? And a king. So to be a priest, according to the law, he had to fulfill the law before he could take it out of the way and become the priest after the order of Melchizedek. He had to be baptized, didn't he? Because that's exactly what they did with Aaron in the door of the tabernacle. It says they washed him with water. That means they stripped him down and took a scrub brush and scrubbed him down. That was the last thing that that was. They took a branch of hyssop, dipped it in water, and sprinkled him on his head. Let's go to uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 5. Well... Luke chapter 1, verse 5, tells us that, uh, John, who the John the Baptist's parents were. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. We're going to take time to read this one. I'll kind of watch here. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. Oh, a priest? His name was Zacharias. Of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Well, we know that Zacharias and Elizabeth, and you know the rest of the story. I hope you do. If you don't, read the rest of that chapter. Let every word come forth, and the same light shine on all of them. But you'll see that Zacharias named him a name as according to the angel Gabriel gave him. And there wasn't anybody in his family named John before. But they named him John. And he wrote out, his name is John when they got to arguing that nobody else had been named like that. But in chapter uh, 3, beginning with verse 3, we see some things here that Luke added to the account. In chapter 3, beginning with verse 3, well, look at the... Well, yeah, let's look at verse 2 here. Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. Oh, wait a minute. Where'd they come from? I thought John the Baptist was the last of the priests. You ever hear of a guy that's called a pope? How's he get to be pope? He's elected, isn't he? How'd these guys get to be there? Same way. Same way. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Was that a water baptism, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins? No. No, it wasn't. 
What does the word baptism mean in Scripture? What's the, what's the scriptural meaning of the word baptism? Well, it's initiation, purification, cleansing, and ident- or identification. Were they cleansed by sprinkling water on them? What was the first thing he said to do? Repent and be what? Baptized. The repentance comes first. What was it that Israel had to be repent of? Being stiff-necked. Now let's look at what the account says here. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And as you go on and read the, first, the next three verses, you read the same thing that's quoted from the Old Testament. How many people tell you that that water baptism saved them? It didn't. Water baptism has never, does not, and never will save anybody. It's an identification that he has been purified, cleansed, or initiated. Water baptism has never is not and never will save anybody. That's a strong statement. And I expect some uh, uh, reprisals from some of those that's watching. Now, when we we think about these things, turn to uh, this baptism. Let's turn to someone that the Apostle Paul talks about. We're going to shift gears here. John the Baptist's baptism was for the nation of Israel. They was to come into their kingdom hope. He came on the scene right in here. He was talking about whether he didn't know anything about this. He was totally ignorant of this. He he knew nothing about it. God had never told him anything about it. He was preparing for this right here. And as The Apostle Paul came first on the scene. He was seen as Saul of Tarsus, wasn't he? What did he look like? What did he act like? What did he sound like? He sounded like that guy supposed to come right in here, didn't he? Antichrist. But he wasn't. And uh, the the Lord about scared the socks off of him uh, when he he met him on the road to Damascus. And uh, he changed. And he told something that we're under today, and we still are. But what about what took place here afterwards and so forth? Well, let's see what he talks about here after God uh, scared the liver and onions out of him. And uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. We're going to see something here that I've got some books at home on baptism. And I went through those, some of those books, and some of the excuses they come up with for this verse is, <laughs> it's like trying to go to the field with a four-wheel drive and have an Alice Chalmers WD-45 out there. And those were made back in the 50s. And you can see these four-wheel drive tractors today, they're huge. We got one at home, it's got tires on it that wide, and it's got eight tires on it. You ought to replace them. We did once. First Corinthians ten, verse one. More were brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, stop and think about this a minute. Where had Moses been when God told him to take this nation and cross the Red Sea? He'd been outside of Egypt, hadn't he? For how long? Forty years. How many people in in, uh, Egypt of the nation of Israel would have known Moses? Now think about it. And uh, another pastor and I years and years ago, uh, over half a century ago, sat down and figured out about how many Jews there would have been at that time. There's over three million of them. How many of those three million had been born in the last 30 years? 
the last 40 years when he was gone. So how many of them knew him? Not very many, was he? So they was, it says they were baptized unto Moses. Now remember, they were initiated, cleansed, purified, or identified baptized unto, and that says unto Moses, that's where two or more shall meet. They met Moses. And I don't know how many verse, uh, books I had at home that went through all the contortions and everything that you could go through to try to prove to me that that word unto was into. I'd like to see you put three million people in one guy. That's just absolute foolishness. Stupidity. And I've seen some stupid stuff. So there, when there was baptized unto Moses, they met with him and was identified with him. Now when they crossed the Red Sea, how many of them got wet? Not one of them. Zero. How many of the Egyptians got baptized? <laughs> you see, they was immersed. Now, let me ask you this. These people that tell you that you should be baptized like Jesus was, and he had a death baptism, how long was he in that grave? Three days and three nights. So if you dunk a guy three days and three nights in water, what are you going to have? One drowned duck. <laughs> That's... Two baptisms, well, we've seen a couple of those. And let's look at one more. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and this is the one that deals with us. We're not going to have time this morning to deal with all 12 of these. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. There's one body. This, is, this passage is referred to as the seven ones. Because there are seven number ones here. And you count the things if you want to. I can tell you already that there are seven here. There's one body. There's one spirit. Even though you called in one hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One baptism. Oh, we've already seen three or four of them. But Paul says there's one. Now, don't forget Paul's talking about this group right in this period of time right here. There's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in y'all. Now, Paul did come from Georgia because he said y'all come from, uh, he talks about y'all there. <laughs> See that? So, and, I, and that's not the only place he does that either. Turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's look at verses 12 and 13. Now he's talking about the physical body here. Now, we're talking about baptisms. And he associates the physical body with something spiritual that he's talking about. For there's, the body is one, for as the body is one, and hath many members. Well, my body is one. I've got two arms and two hands on the ends of it. I haven't stuck my hand in where it didn't belong at the machine, and I've still got all four fingers on each hand and the thumb. Some guys don't. But it's all one body, isn't it? It all works together, it's supposed to. And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. But look at the next verse. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Where do you see any water in that verse? In those verses. Some people say, well, we've been made to drink into one Spirit. You get a drink of what? Water. Is that the only thing you drink? Do you ever drink coffee? Or somebody before you say maybe something else? 
I, I don't have to wait. I saved my 10 years old, so I never had all, all that to go through. But I, I'll tell you right now, and people by electronic means, I was saved in a Baptist church. So I know what that baptism was, was talked about and what they did and said and so forth. But we're all made to drink into one spirit. The unity of the body of Christ is tremendous. You know how you come here and you hear something for the first time and it just lifts you up and thrills your heart because you know that that's speaking about me and I'm part of it. That person right down the road sitting there with you is the same thing. We have the same thing in Christ. We're baptized into one body. We're initiated into one body, and it's going to be a body that works together. That's the baptism, the one baptism that Apostle Paul is talking about. That's the one that counts for us. I did not say that you're not saved by baptism. I said you're not saved by water baptism. And if you believe that I said that you were, saved, were never saved by baptism, you did the same thing with what I said as you did with what God's Word says. You left the Word out. What's these new perversions do? They leave words out. You see, let every word of God come to the top, let it come up at the same time, and the light's going to shine on it. It's, it's determined to there to prove to us that God knows what he's talking about. Do we? No. Do we even know what Adam knew? You see, God created him and he communicated with him. They talked back and forth, didn't they? God tells us in his word, he's written out everything he wants us to know. And then we pray to him. And Matt did a fine job this morning. I was hesitant to even get up here this morning trying to follow what he had to say. But you see what that one baptism does for us. It places us in the body of Christ. Turn to Romans chapter 6. And I thought, I've got a bookmark there, and I thought Matt was going to take my fire from me this morning. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to start with verse 1. And Romans chapter 6, start, verse 1, starts with two questions. It's a result of what Paul has just said. He says, if sin is this big, it takes this much grace to overcome it. Well, let's do this much sin, and he anticipates what man's going to say. Now, don't forget that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So he knew what was coming. God inspired him to write these two questions down. Well, if it took this much grace to cover up this much sin, why don't we have this much sin so that grace can abound even more? He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. I don't suppose you could get two words to answer any question more complete than that those two words do. No words can complete, compete with those two. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? How are we dead to sin? Look at the next verse. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Notice that that is into, not unto. Into means what? inside the thing. You put in it. You don't just meet Christ. You're placed into him. That's the body of Christ. We talked about those many members. We're placed into Christ as one of those members. And it's going to work together. But he says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ? We're baptized into his death. Now, this is the verse that I've had used on me when I was a young, young person. That's a watery grave. It is. I know it talks about death, 
But where is there any water in that verse? There isn't any. Remember, initiation, purification, cleansing, identification. Man, that covers all four of them, don't it? We're initiated into the body of Christ because we are cleansed and purified, and now we are identified with Christ. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. You talk about an immersion. This is an immersion here. When are you taken out? Matt told us that God, and I'm going to use another term, he doesn't repossess our salvation, does he? We have it for eternity. We are immersed in, if they want to use that, those terms that they use for baptism, they're immersed in Christ. We are immersed in Christ. And when are we taken out? Never. Never. See what that one baptism for us does? What more could you ask for than that? I mean, the wealth of this entire world, this nation, well, what we used to have. <laughs> we don't have much left. <laughs> And we're going downhill fast. What more could you ask for? If you owned the United States, if you owned the whole world, it still would not match what we have in Christ. We can't imagine the glory that's going to follow in the ages to come. And I want you to note one thing. In Ephesians 1.10, that says, In the ages... There's an S on the end of that, E-S. Let those words come forth and let the light shine on them. See what they say. So there's not just one age, it's ages. There's, there, God, I don't know what all he's got in mind. It's a lot better than what we got. I'm not going to be pulling any more weeds. <laughs> For if I like this verse, if we've been planted together. I like to see things planted, and I like to see them grow. I, 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 that's one of my favorite verses. For, <laughs> it really is. It, it really is. We've been planted together. If we're planted together, look at what that says. If we're planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and that's found in Leviticus chapter 17. Take all the blood out of you, out of a human being, and what happens to him? He's deader than a hammer. When the Lord Jesus Christ came back to life, how much blood did he have in his body? He didn't. Where was it? He shed for he shed it for us on the cross, didn't he? When that Roman soldier punctured his side. And by the way, when did that Roman soldier puncture his side? Before or after he gave up the ghost? After. No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down and I take it up again. He proved that he was God. Now there were some things he gave up when he was a man. He could only be in one place at a time. But he knew those things and he grew in, a, in his knowledge and wisdom. And in the last verse in Acts chapter 2. Or, uh, Acts, Luke chapter 2. But let's get back to this baptism. We'll be like him in the resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified. That's not our dad, by the way. <laughs> knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth, from this moment on, we should not serve sin. Why then do we serve sin? Now, Matt mentioned Galatians chapter 3, and I want to mention to you verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? What does it mean 
to be with somebody. Now, he says our old nature, our old man is crucified with Christ. What is the purpose of crucifying something? To put it to death, wasn't it? So our old nature is crucified with Christ. What does he mean by, old foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What's that bewitching do? It brings something back to life that God has declared dead. So what do we do when we're sinning? We resurrect what? The old nature. Anybody here don't do that? So when, when, when we read Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1, oh foolish Galatians, just put your own name in there. Because it's where it belongs. See what that one baptism did for us? I mean, and, and, and they want you to dunk you, sprinkle, splatter, half drown you in water, whatever. And what good's that going to do? It does want two things again. One, the first thing going to get you wet somewhere on the head, on, on an infant, infant baptisms. Most of the time, they got to have this little kid laying up there with nothing on him. What do you do when you pour water on your head? He does. <laughs> and, and everybody laughs. That's a baptism? That's going to give him that false sense of security for eternity? Now, just what's between these ears? Nothing. Why don't people look at what the Word of God says? Look at every word and how every word ends and give it all the same amount of light. Let them all come up at the same time and it will yield what it's supposed to out there. Turn to Gal- uh, Let's go to Galatians. Well, I already told you about Galatians 3.1. There's one other baptism that I want to cover that... Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 has a tremendous amount of wealth in there. But I want to look at verse 29. And some of these books that I've got at home does everything except tell you what it means or they skip it completely because they, they don't understand it. They don't know what it means. Now, when we study the Word of God, you not only look at the words in the verse, you look at where the verse is in its context. Is that in the chapter? Is it in the context of the chapter, or is it in the whole book, the whole letter? You've got to determine that, and that's some things that we have here in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 29. Yes, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? For, or if the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? What is the real problem here? What is it that they're really seek, seeking out? What is it that's going on here? If you go, how far back do you have to go to answer this in the book of 1 Corinthians? Chapter 1. Okay, let's go back to chapter 1 then. Verse 17. Paul takes care of this. God inspired him to take care of this at the beginning of the letter. Very very first thing. He, he gets down to verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. If the gospel included baptism, don't you think Paul would be part of it? That doesn't take too many smarts. Even I can figure that out. But he says, what happens when you start with baptism? Not with wisdom, and he's talking here about water. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 
how does the cross of Christ affect each one of us? It gives us life eternal, doesn't it? What does Peter say about the cross of Christ with the nation of Israel? What, did they, what does he call it that they did to the, say, the, their Messiah on that cross? It was a murder weapon. Christ was not deserving to die. So you murdered him. If we baptize with that water, what's it done with the cross of Christ? It's take, the cross of Christ is the beginning of the gospel for us. In other words, had it not been for that cross, we wouldn't have salvation, would we? It makes it of none effect. And if that water does all those things, okay, he he says, I'm not sent to do all that. Turn to uh, chapter 12 and verse 13. We've already read this one. Probably should get by without reading it. But I'm going to read it anyhow. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So now he's telling us that he wasn't sent to water baptize, but we are baptized by one spirit into the body of, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, and he's already talked about what that body is. That's the body of Christ in verse 12. Whether we bond or friend, we've all been made to drink in one spirit. So we've got a unity here, a unified body of Christ that's never going to change, that's doing the same thing all the way through eternity, and that's glorifying God. Okay, so he's not sent to, to water baptize. We're members of the body of Christ by spiritual baptism. And there's only one. And now we've got these guys over here try, in chapter 15 baptizing for the dead. Somebody died. I'll be baptized for him to get him to heaven. Want to bet? He says this, if you look at the context of this, it's just plain foolishness. And that's one of the things, that Paul doesn't do that very often, but to the Corinthians he says twice that they were fooled. You know what foolishness is? Going against what God said. What did Israel do? They, they were stiff-necked. They went against what God said, didn't they? He says, Else what shall they do? And he's arguing here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Sadducees didn't. So there must have been some Sadducees going around and telling these people that there was no resurrection. Now remember where the Apostle Paul was. He was right in here. Where those Corinthians come from? Idolatry. And it was all over town. So they had to be reminded almost daily that they weren't to get involved in all that stuff. Keep in mind where they were when that was stated. And it'll help you understand a lot. Here he's telling these people, don't get involved with that kind of a bunch of nonsense. He's not telling them that there is a baptism that you can take care of somebody, some sinner that died and he's already roasting in hell. He's telling you don't get involved in that kind of stuff. Now I've got one other thing I'd like to mention to you. We've got a, a sign up over right over there on that table. This fall, I've got 48 seconds, 46 uh, we're going to have a conference down there in Ridge Farm. We'd like to invite everybody here down there. There's some flyers there, and there's some outside on the table if you run out there. And if you run out all together, find somebody has got one, copy it. And David Reed's going to be one of our speakers, Brother Jordan. And uh, we got Rodney Ballou, I call him, like Ballou the Bear in that cartoon the kids used to watch. Uh, Boyer. Uh, that's right. Uh, I didn't know whether he was French or uh, uh, Lower Slavovian because there are not many Slavs left. Uh, so uh, 
we'll leave it as friends. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done for us in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word, for what it says to us. And we pray that we might be each one determined to let each word show the light that you have placed upon each one. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen.